hi everyone welcome once more to this youtube channel today we're going to take a topic from general chemistry chemical bonding so this topic is meant for students in their first year of high institution offering chemistry people in chem students in chemistry microbiology biochemistry engineering all science students will find this topic interesting and also people who are in their final years of high school or secondary school and also benefit from this topic so today we're looking at chemical bonding um, in chemical reactions elements combine to form either molecules or compounds elements are active because they have valence electrons with which they combine with each other um, there are some elements that are unreactive we know in chemistry like noble gases are very unreactive helium, neon, argon, xenon, krypton these noble gases are very unreactive and because of their weight of electrons they have complete atomic shell and they don't tend to be unreactive during chemical reactions they don't undergo chemical bonding except few of them like xenon and krypton can, can react in some situations with fluorine using the expanded shell so Zen and Krypton among the noble gas can react in certain cases. If apart from these two I mentioned, most other noble gases, helium, neon, argon, are unreactive because they have complete atomic shell. So when elements come together to form com molecule or to form compounds, we say that they, are, they, they have engaged in chemical bonding or chemical combination. So this is the property of elements in group one, group two, group three, group four, group five, group C seven and even those in the transition series these elements combine with others or with each other to form molecules or compounds chemical bonding can involve electron transfer from one element to another so when chemical bonding involves electron transfer from one element to another we call it ionic bonding and then it can also involve sharing of equal number of valence electrons so when electrons are being shared between atoms we we'll say that we we'll have covalent bonding. So here we go. Chemical bonding is a combination of atoms or ions to form molecules or compounds. Noble gases, helium, neon, argon, xenon, and krypton in bracket are known to be stable due to the position of complete atomous valence shells satisfying the duplet and other state helium with only k shell few double with two electrons is said to be in duplet state other noble gases such as neon the number is 10 having two in the l shell and eight two in the k shell and eight in the l shell argon 18 having two in the k shell eight in the l shell and eight in the m shell and so on have all eight electrons in their valence electrons i would say they are all atomic electrons and they are said to satisfy the altered state so as i said helium has duplex state because it has only k shell and that k shell is filled up other noble gases have electrons in the atom shell and they say we say, we say they are in altered state so let's go ahead this condition is an inherent property of group 8 or 18 elements their weight of electrons give them the unique name noble gases while their unreactive nature gives them the name inert gases so the elements in group 8 are called noble gases because they have plenty of electrons, they have complete atomic shell. And they are called inert gases because they are reactive, they have zero valency. The other elements in the group, other groups in the periodic table, do not possess such uniqueness, uniqueness as noble gases. Hence, have incomplete valence shells or atomic electrons. As a result, these elements are not inert but reactive and tend to react with themselves to form molecules and compounds 
that will satisfy the duplet and altered state of noble gases. Hence, elements engage in chemical bonding in order to attain the stability of noble gases, either duplet state or altered state. Chemical bonding occurs in the valence shell or atmos shells of the atoms and involve only the valence electrons or atomos ele electrons. Chemical bonding may involve donation of valence electrons or sharing of valence electrons. So as I explained before, I said in this video, as I said, chemical bonding occurs between two or more atoms. These atoms could be metals, non-metals, and so on. So chemical bonding can occur between a metal and a non-metal. When chemical bonding occur between a metal and a non-metal, the metal will donate is all of its valence electrons to the non-metal. The metal will donate all of its valence electrons to the non-metal. Because we know in chemistry that metals are electropositive, the electron donors. So in chemical bonding, the electron metal will donate all of its valence electrons to the non-metals, while the non-metal will accept to become complete. We we'll call such bonding ionic bonding or trivalent bonding. It's a very strong bond in chemistry. Then in covalent bonding, uh, the two it normally occurs between two or more non-metals, whereby these atoms bring equal number of valence electrons for sharing in order to attain altered state. So covalency occurs mainly in non-metals. So it involves electron sharing, not electron donation, because non-metals cannot donate electrons to each other, rather they will share electrons. As we go on, we're going to see meet other types of chemical bonding, like the coordinate covalent bonding. That is also a, a special kind of a covalent bonding, which is somehow slightly different from covalent bonding. And the essence of bonding, as we said, is for elements or atoms to have complete atomic shell, or to attain noble gas stability. Okay? Although we still have molecules that do not at, that do not uh, obey the altered rule. I mean, whereby the elements use expanded shell, or whereby after bonding, the central element has less than eight electrons, or has more than eight electrons, which I'll come to that later on in the maybe subsequent videos. So, remain connected and continue to watch as we continue. Those of you that are not subscribed to the channel, tap on the subscription bell on the icon the subscription bell and get connected to the channel for tutorial videos as we continue. So we have types of chemical bonding now. The main types of chemical bonding include ionic, otherwise known as, known as retrovalent bonding, covalent bonding, otherwise called covalency, coordinate covalency, dirty bonding, metallic bonding, and then hydrogen bonding. So, they are the major types of chemical bonding we have. So, we're going to start with ionic bonding. To summarize ionic bonding, this is a bond that involves metal and non-metal. Any compound that has a metal and a non-metal in it possesses ionic bond, otherwise it's called electrovalent bond. We know in chemistry that metals are electron donors, that metals donate their valence electrons to non-metals. So, during chemical bonding, or during the formation of any compound, the metal will donate its atomous electron or valence electron, all of it, to the non-metallic atoms to form uh, ionic bond. So when the metal donates electrons to the non-metal, it forms a positive ion. While the non-metal that accepts, it forms a negative ion. Then the electrostatic attraction that is formed uh, that exists between the positive metallic ion, which is also known as cation. And then the negative non-metallic ion, which is called an anion, is what constitutes ionic bonding. So let's go through the material. Say so this is the type of chemical bonding which occurs when a metallic atom donates its valence electron to a non-metallic atom, leading to the production of stable, oppositely charged ions. So the distinguishing features of ionic bonding include the following. It must occur between metallic atom or atoms 
and non-metallic atom or atoms. The metallic atom or atoms donate or donate its valence electrons to the non-metallic atom or atoms. At the end of ionic bonding, the metallic atom would acquire a positive ch charge, hence becomes what called a cation. Cation means an ion that has a positive charge. Why the non-metallic atom, which has acid electrons, from the metal acquires negative charge becomes what's called an anion. The electrostatic attraction between these oppositely charged ions constitutes ionic bonding. Since ionic bonding occurs between metals and non-metals, it, it therefore follows that it is the strongest and it is formed between elements at the extreme of the periodic table, such as observed in sodium chloride. Sodium is in group 1, the extreme left of the periodic table, and chlorine in group 7, the extreme right of the periodic table. So ionic bonding is formed between elements that have large electronic difference. That is an element in a metallic group, which is normally at the left-hand side of the periodic table, and element on the right-hand side, which is a, a non-metal. Ionic bonding occurs between atoms of large electronic difference, as I said before, and is a polar bond. It means that compounds form as a result of ionic bonding dissolved in water. Typical examples of ionic compounds include sodium chloride, potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, sodium fluoride, calcium fluoride, sodium oxide, magnesium oxide, copper 2 oxide, magnesium bromide, and sodium bromide. Look at those compounds there, those are any compounds. They all contain metal and non metal. Sodium is a metal, fluoride is a non metal. Potassium is a metal, magnesium is a metal, calcium is a metal, fluoride is a non metal. So you see that the compounds contain metal and non metal. That's why they are called ionic compounds. So we'll now go to illustration of ionic bonding. How do we illustrate ionic bonding? So in this tutorial, we're going to illustrate ionic bonding using the Lewis electron dot method. The Lewis electron dot method. The steps involved are outlined below. The first step, split the compound into its constituent atoms. Second step, write the electronic configuration of each atom. Third, use dot to represent only the valence electrons surrounding each atom. Fourth step, identify the metallic atom or atoms and the non-metallic atom or atoms. Then fifth step, Transfer the valence electron from the metallic atoms or atom to the non-metallic atom or atoms. Then, the other step, final step, assign positive sign to electron deficient metallic atom and negative sign to electron rich non-metallic atom. The magnitude of the charges will depend on the number of electrons lost and gained. So let's take examples now. Example one. Once you dissolve the body in sodium chloride, NaCl, as you can see here, split into sodium and chlorine. So there are one, there is only one atom of sodium, and then one atom of chlorine, as you can see the splitting. Then on that sodium, we write the electronic configuration of sodium, which is for atom number is 11, 2, 8, 1, metal and a non-metal. How do I define the metal? As we said before in the previous video. A metal does not have more than three electrons in the atomic shell. Sodium has only one in the M shell, and that makes it a metal. A non-metal has more than three electrons in the atomic shell. Chlorine has seven, and that makes it a non-metal. In the bonding, the metal will donate electron to the non-metal. So sodium will donate each one electron to the non-metal. So sodium has the metal donate. Sodium going to donate one since it has only one in the atomic shell. You're going to donate one to chlorine. And remember, look at chlorine. Chlorine has seven and requires one to complete its atomic shell or, or test state. So let's go to the process involved. So in the process, look at sodium atom with one electron. That red dot is the one electron on sodium. We represent the atomic electron. So that dot close to sodium by the right-hand side is the electron of sodium. The two, that is one electron. So it's 2, 8, 1. And chlorine. Look at the green dots. Chlorine has seven electron atomic shell. So you see how it represented. 
the green dots can then that seven we put electron single one one on north side one on the east side one electron on the west side and one on the on the on the east side so when we have placed it on one one on the cardinal points we'll now start doubling remaining three remaining uh three will now double double the north the south and the east so you, to put electrons around the atom put them one 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 that is single single around the set the cable the atom and then double the ones you have already double the ones you already place single so that you can achieve the number of electrons that are in the atom of shell so you look at chlorine right you have some electrons so the metal being sodium will donate electron to the non-metal can see the arrow going from sodium to chlorine so when sodium donates to chlorine chlorine now becomes look at the product chlorine now becomes eight you can see what electrons of chlorine is now red colored meaning that it came from sodium so chlorine now has complete atomic shell two four six eight around the chlorine see electrons the red one came from sodium so the electronic composition of this chlorine now becomes two eight eight no longer two eight seven why is it two eight eight because it had gained extra one electron unlike previous thing when it was two eight seven getting extra one now becomes two eight eight and then two eight eight if you add electrons two plus eight plus eight that gives you eighteen it corresponds to element called argon with 18 electrons. Sodium has lost one. So losing one, you now have eight. Remember that sodium before was 281. Two in the K shell, uh, eight in the L shell, and one in the M shell. But that one in the M shell has vanished or have been lost to chlorine. So what do we now represent around sodium? We now represent eight. Eight electrons. That eight electrons are the ele eight electrons in the our share of sodium now the, the the eight red balls run sodium are the eight electrons in the L share of sodium now we don't call this sodium an atom again it's now called an ion when the metal loses electron it becomes poetry charge so sodium has lost one becomes plus one when a non-metal gains electron it becomes negative charge so chlorine has gained one it becomes negative charge that minus one so we now call this sodium ion and chloride ion Sodium now resembles neon, that is 2 plus 8, 10, 10 electrons and correspond to neon. Why? Chloride ion now resembles argon, 2, 8, 8. So they are now ions, or we can call sodium ion a cation, or we can call chloride ion an anion. We'll now go to example two. Example two is calcium oxide. We have the element split into two, calcium and oxygen. In the compound, there's only one atom of calcium and then one atom of oxygen. Write the electronic composition of calcium. Calcium from 20, we place the electrons in under the KLM shell, 2882. For oxygen, we have eight. We place it under the K shell, 2, 6. Cash is a metal by virtue of having not more than three electrons in the in the N shell atom of shell. It has only two. Also, is a non-metal by having more than three electrons in the atom of shell, having up to six in the atom of shell. Then we we'll now go. We we'll now represent the two electrons in the atom of shell of calcium. You can see the two red dots. We we'll also represent the six electrons in the atom of shell of uh, oxygen. That run oxygen. That is it. We have uh, put them single one, two, three, four, and then double them to make it them out to six. Then the metal will definitely donate electron to the non-metal. So calcium will donate all of these two electrons to oxygen. We look at oxygen. Oxygen requires to become complete to make it up to up to eight. That means that two will come from calcium. One of the calcium electrons goes to one of the unpaired oxygen electron, and the other one goes to the other unpaired oxygen electron. And the can call sodium ion a cation, or can call chloride ion an anion. We now go to example two. Example two is calcium oxide. We have the elements split into two: calcium and oxygen. In the compound, there's only one atom of calcium and then one out of oxygen. 
write the electronic control of calcium, calcium from 20, you place the electrons in under the KLM shell, 2882. First gene, we have 8, we place it under the K shell, 26. Cash is a metal by virtue of having not more than 3 electrons in the, in the N shell, atom shell, it has only 2. Also, is a non-metal by having more than 3 electrons in the atom shell, having up to 6 in the atom shell. Then, we now go, we now represent the 2 electrons in the atom shell of calcium, you can see the 2 red dots. We also represent the 6 electrons in the atom shell of uh, oxygen, that I run oxygen, that is it. We we'll have uh, put them single, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then double them to make it them out to 6. Then the metal will definitely donate electron to the non-metal. So calcium will donate all of these two electrons to oxygen. We look at oxygen. Oxygen requires to become complete to make it up to up to eight. That means that two will come from calcium. One of the calcium electrons goes to one of the unpaired oxygen electron, and the other one goes to the other unpaired oxygen electron. At the end of the day, calcium donates everything in that motion while oxygen becomes complete. So going to oxygen first. You see that oxygen has some green and red electrons. Those green electrons are oxygen electrons, while the red ones are the ones you got from calcium, making it 8 in that mode shell. Then oxygen was formerly 2 cis in that mode shell, you can see that, but now it is 2 8. Why 2 8? It has gained 2 from calcium to make that mode shell complete. So if I had electron of uh, oxygen, 2 plus 8 is 10. That corresponds to neon. Then oxygen is no longer called an atom, it's now called an ion, called oxide ion. The charge is now negative 2 because it has gained 2. As, as it said before, if a non-metal gains, it becomes negative charge. Why if a metal loses, it becomes positive charge. The amount of the charge depends on the number of electrons it gained or it lost. If it gains 1, minus 1. If it gains 2, minus 2. If it gains 3, the charge becomes minus 3. If it loses 1, plus 1. loses 2, plus 2. So calcium has lost 2. Formerly, calcium was 2882. The electron in the end shell 2 have been removed, remaining now 288 as argon. So we we'll now represent the electron in the in the atom shell, that is the M shell, which is now 8 rand calcium. And because it had lost 2, it becomes plus 2. The child becomes plus 2. So we'll go to the third example. Example 3 is magnesium fluoride. If you look at this bicolor substance, this substance consists of um, a metal and a non-metal. It consists of two elements, magnesium and fluorine, yes, but three atoms, unlike the previous examples. Why did I say three atoms? One atom of magnesium and two atoms of fluorine. So you can see the distribution. The element that has only one atom is placed at the middle, which is magnesium, while fluorine that has two atoms are played by the side. So you write the electronic coefficient of each of them. Fluorine is 9, 2, 7 under the K and L shell respectively. Magnesium is 12, 2, 8, 2 under the K, L and M shell respectively. And fluorine is 9 also, the same similar to the first one, 2 and 7 and 7 under the K and L shell. We now use balls to present the electrons in their atomous shells respectively. Fluorine has 7 in the L shell. You can look at fluorine. You can see the electrons around it, there are seven, two, four, six, seven. Also, the same fluorine on the right hand side of a magnesium, also two, four, six, seven. You put them one, one before you start doubling them. While magnesium has only two in atomosphere, now put two on, on the two sides, left and right, for easy bonding. Now, in the process, the metal will lose the two electrons. Why do the metal? Each other requires one, one to come complete. That means one for magnesium will go to the fluorine on the right hand side, and one electron for magnesium will go to the fluorine on the right hand side. So you look at it. So at, after bonding, it's the magnesium now, which was 282 before, we now lose that two and now become 28 after losing two. The eight electrons represent is now the electron in the L shell that will represent the, in the atomic shell of magnesium. That is, you can see the red balls, eight around magnesium. Then having lost two, we now say, charge of plus two, the magnesium ion. While fluorine, each of the atoms gain one. So after a certain one, we now have two, four, six, eight. They are gaining extra one. And then by gaining one, it becomes charge. 
it was 27 before he should run out on 27 now it becomes 28 not 27 that's an error it becomes 28 just like a like a neon So fluorine now becomes 28, the error corrected. So and now looks like neon. So but there are two fluorine atoms. Instead of drawing them separately, you put a bracket and put two in front of the bracket to show that you now have two fluoride ions formed from two fluorine atoms. So we'll go to the next example. The next example is potassium oxide. You have this compound similar to the other one we used before. It has two elements, potassium and oxygen, but it has three atoms. Three atoms because of two atoms of potassium and one atom of oxygen. You place the elements, the one that has only one atom at the middle, and that one is oxygen at the middle, as you can see there. Where the one that has more than one atom, the potassium will be one on the left and one on the right. So a situation whereby an, a compound has more than two atoms, the element that has only one atom is the one you position at the middle. Whether it's a metal or non-metal, does not matter. Then look at potassium. You have 19. The, uh, the different coefficient is 2881 under the K, L, and M shell. Also, the other potassium at the, at the right-hand side of, of us will have the same electronic structure. Why oxygen? That is eight. We now have two C's. Look at the structure. The metal is potassium because it does not have more than three in the atom shell. Why the non-metal is oxygen because it has more than three in the L shell. The metal potassium will lose its electron. Why electron? Why the non-metal oxygen will gain electrons? So potassium will lose one, one. Why oxygen requires two? And by looking at it very well by inspection, you're going to see that each potassium atom will donate one to oxygen. So that at the end of the day, also now becomes eight or complete. Why potassium will also become complete by losing one electron. So let's go to illustration. Look at the illustration. On the left hand side, you can see two potassium, each of them having one more electron in the atomous shell. Why oxygen has six in the atomous shell? You have six balls around oxygen, six green balls around oxygen. And potassium being a metal, each of them will lose one electron. See the arrow pointing from potassium to oxygen, from each potassium atom to oxygen. So the metal will lose electron to the non-metal. So at the end of the day, oxygen, potassium, which was formerly 2881, will now become, each of them become 288, having lost one each. 288, that is 18 argon, looking like argon. And they become potty child because they are lost one. Then why do we have two in front of that potassium ion? That two shows that there are two potassium atoms, so it's going to produce two potassium ions. Why oxygen? We look at oxygen ion, oxide ion formed. You see the red balls gain from potassium. Two red balls gain from the two potassium atoms. So around oxygen, you have two, four, six, eight electrons around oxygen, making it complete. But the child because minus two because he has gained two electrons. So oxygen ion, or that ion is now two eight complete, like neon. Two plus eight is ten. That is neon. We now go over to the properties of ionic compounds or equivalent compounds. The first property is that they are solids of high melting and boiling point. Their high melting and boiling point is due to strong electrostatic force of attraction existing between opposite charge ions, that is the polar ion and the, the ion. So the attraction between polar ion and that is very strong. And it requires a lot of heat to break this attraction. That is why they have high melting and boiling point. Two, they consist of aggregate of ions clustered together. Three, they are soluble in polar solvent. Example of polar solvent is water, but insoluble in, but insoluble in non-polar solvent, such as petrol, kerosene, benzene, trichloromethane, tetrachloromethane, and hexane. So they dissolve in water and they don't dissolve in organic solvents or what's called non-polar solvents. So that's why they are ionic in nature. So number three, they are soluble in, okay, we well, said that one before. Number four, aqueous solution of ionic compounds are electrolyzed. That is, they, they conduct electricity when dissolving water. 
that is the conduct which is in our question due to movement of mobile ions. So there are solutions electrolyte because they, the solution contain mobile ions. So let's go to this exercise that says briefly explain why crystals of sodium chloride do not conduct electricity, but in its aqueous solution con it conducts electricity. So you have to explain why this compound called sodium chloride crystal means solid state. When it's in solid state, it can conduct current. But when it is in solution of water, it conducts electricity. Solution says crystals of sodium chloride is in solid state and cannot conduct electricity because it contains aggregate of immobile sodium and chloride ions. So in solid state, the ions are immobile, they are clustered together, they cannot move. While in aqueous solution, sodium chloride associates into mobile sodium and chloride ions and thus conduct electricity in aqueous state. So for any compound to conduct any compound to conduct electricity, it must be in solution because in solution the ions are free to move. So an ion can conduct current only when it's moving, when it's mobile. And that happens when any compound dissolves in water. In solid state, it can conduct current because in solid state, ions are immobile, they don't move, they're not in motion, and they cannot carry electric charges. We'll now go to the next kind of bonding called covalent bonding. Now, we are done ionic bonding. The summary of ionic bonding is that normally it involves a metal and a non metal. And in such process, the metal will donate its valence electron to the non metal, which accepts the valence electron for the non from the metal to have a complete atom of shell. At the end of ionic bonding, the metal that had donated will form a positive ion, while the non-metal that accepted will form a negative ion. So any bonding occur between a metal and a non-metal. When I go to covalent bonding, covalent bonding is usually found between non-metals, non-metallic atoms. When two non-metals combine, none of them can donate electron completely to the other. That's impossible. So when you combine two non-metals, what happens is that the, the two non-metals will share their valence electrons. They contribute equal number of electrons for sharing. Each of them bring equal number. Like if a non-metal S brings one electron, another one S also bring another ele one electron. If a non-metal Y brings two electrons, another non-metal Y also bring two electrons. They bring equal number for bonding. So that is what we call covalent bonding. And the essence is also to attain complete atomal share, either duplet or altered state of noble gases. So, non uh, covalent bonding is normally found between non metallic atoms. But can we have covalent bonding between a metal and a non metal? The answer is yes and also no. It can also occur between a metal and a non metal, provided that that metal is not all that strongly electropositive, like aluminium and boron. When they combine with halogens, they, some, they produce a covalent bond because they are not strongly electropositive. Also, metalloids also form covalent bonding with non-metals. So let's go on. He said this is the type of chemical bonding which usually involves sharing of equal number of valent electrons between, between non-metallic atoms leading to the production of stable molecules. The distinguishing features of covalent bonding include include one it occurred between two or more non-metallic atoms yeah in bracket in rare cases it can occur between weak electropotive metals such as aluminium and chlorine and also between metalloids such as boron and fluorine as i pointed at the beginning of this uh, lecture it involves the chain of equal number of valence electrons contributed by participating atoms. So it involves sharing of electrons, uh, vice electrons. Why anybody involved electron donation? Okay. The number of between metalloids, such as boron and fluorine, as I pointed at the beginning of this uh, lecture. It involves the chain of equal number of vice electrons contributed by participating atoms. So it involves sharing of electrons, uh, vice electrons, why anybody involved electron donation? Okay, the number of valence electrons each atom would contribute for covalency is equal to the number of, elect of electrons it requires for to complete its atomic 
is valence shell. This is a very important point. During covalency, how do you know how many electrons each atom contribute? The number of electrons each atom contribute for covalency is nothing but how many electrons it needs to complete its atom shell. For example, oxygen is 8, which is 2, 6. If you write the electronic configuration, oxygen requires to become complete. So when oxygen combines, when oxygen is involved in covalent bonding, you're going to bring 2 for sharing because it needs to become complete. Chlorine, that is 17, atomic number is 17, is 287. It needs only one electron to become complete. If chlorine is found in covalency, it's going to bring only one electron for sharing. Nitrogen is 7, that is 2, 5. It needs 3 to complete its L shell. So if nitrogen is involved in covalent bonding, it's going to bring out 3 for covalency. So in covalency, the number of electrons an atom requires or will contribute for covalency is nothing but how many electrons it needs to, become to make its atom shell complete. So, having done that, we we'll now move. We said that covalent bonding occurs in liquids and gases. So, you normally find in molecules. It's not found in solids. Take examples of covalent molecules include homonuclear molecules, such as hydrogen, chlorine, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, bromine. Why do we call them homonuclear? They are molecules that contain similar atoms. They also find them in heteronuclear molecules, that molecules that contain different atoms, CO2, H2O, ammonia, and, and, and methane. You look at the whole molecules, we we'll take it as illustration. All the elements there are non-metals. Hydrogen is non-metal, chlorine is non-metal, oxygen is non-metal, nitrogen is non-metal, fluorine is non-metal, carbon is non-metal, bromine is non-metal. In CO2, you have carbon and oxygen, two non-metals. In water, you have hydrogen and oxygen, two non-metals. In ammonia, you have nitrogen and hydrogen, two non-metals. In methane, you have carbon and hydrogen, also two non-metals. Then, giant structures such as diamond, which contains strong covalent bonds. You can see have covalent bonding, yes, in solids. Some solids like diamond, uh, graphite, and the uh, sand, silica, they are uh, giant structures. They are solids, but they still contain covalent bond. Diamond contains very strong covalent bonds. That's why it has a very high melting point, as if it's any compound, but it's not. Then, molecules containing weak reputed metals are, and metalloids, are, such as aluminum chloride, beryllium hydride, boron uh, fluoride, and diborane. So these molecules also have a, a covalent bonding, even though they contain metals and non-metals. Those metal, those the metals they are weak uh, metals, while the metalloids they are also are not as strong. They are not strong. They don't have strong metallic character. So that will say that the bond is also a metallic. Is also covalent bond, as we described earlier on. So let's go to illustration of covalent bond. How do we illustrate covalent bonding? The first is split the molecules into each constituent atom, the, way, the same way you did any bonding. Write the electronic coefficient of each atom. Use dots to present only the valence electrons surrounding each atom. For a homonuclear molecule, determine the number of uh, electrons each atom requires to complete its valence shell. This is the number of uh, electrons each atom would contribute for bonding, as we explained earlier on. In the case of heteronuclear molecule, I mean the number of electrons the central atom will require for com to complete its atomous shell, valence shell, and share this number of electrons among the atoms surrounding the central atom. So let's now go to illustration. That will make it better for us or clearer for us. Then, before we go to the illustration, there are two types of valence electrons in a molecule or in a covalent molecule. So there are two types of atomous electrons we see in a covalent molecule. The two types of valence electrons include lone pair, called known as non-bonding pair of electrons. So these are the valence electrons in a molecule that are not used in bond formation. So in a molecule, those electrons in the atomous shell that are not used in bond formation are called the lone pairs or non-bonding pairs of electrons. So going over to the bonding pair of electrons. The bonding pair, otherwise known as bond or shared pairs of electrons. So these are valence electrons. 
in the molecule that are involved in bond formation. A bonding pair of electrons constitutes a single covalent bond. Two bonding pairs constitute a double covalent bond. Why three bonding pairs constitute a triple covalent bond? So what we are saying is that we have two types of electro uh, valence electrons in a molecule, in a covalent molecule. We have the one we call the lone pair or non-bonding pair. Lone pair, from the word lonely, lone pair, not involved in bonding. So those electrons in the covalent molecule, in the valence shell of the molecules or of the atoms in the molecule that are not using bonding are called lone pairs. That's why they are called non-bonding pairs. We say these are the valence electrons in the molecule that are not used in bond formation. I you know valence electrons means electrons in the atomic shell. Then bonding or bond pairs of electrons. These are the electrons in the atomic shell or the valence electrons in the molecule that are involved in bond formation. A bonding pair of electrons constitutes a single covalent bond. So when you have a pair used, a pair means two, two electrons you use to form covalent bond. That represents a single bond. If two pairs are used to form a bond, that is four electrons are used to form a bond, covalent bond, that represents a double covalent bond or in short double bond. Why if three pairs of electrons are used in bond formation, three pairs means six electrons are used to form a covalent bond that will constitute a triple covalent bond. Move to another term called bond order. Bond order. This refers to the number of bonding pairs of electrons between two atoms. A bond order of one implies that a pair of electrons is shared between two atoms. Bond order of two implies that two pairs of electrons is shared between two atoms. Why bond order of three shows that three pairs of electrons is shared between two covalently bonded atoms. So to understand all these concepts, all we have to do now is to go to illustration of covalency and then explain from there. First, we're going to look at the of covalency in homonuclear molecules. As I told you initially, homonuclear molecules are those molecules that contain similar atoms, like hydrogen molecule contains two hydrogen atoms. So we see the electronic coefficient of hydrogen, the number is one. We have one electron placed in the K shell, under the K shell for each of the hydrogen atoms. The hydrogen metal, no, even though it does not have all to three in the atomic shell, it's an, it's an exemption, not a metal, it's a non metal. So, the K shell, remember in covalent bonding, electrons are not donated. So, when you have two non metals, they cannot donate electrons to themselves, rather, they will share electrons. So, in homonuclear atoms, you ask yourself, how many electrons does each of the other atoms require to come complete? K shell is complete when it, it, it has two electrons. That means each of them will require one one electron become complete. And I told you initially in homonuclear molecules, when you want to do covalent bonding, the number of electrons each atom will donate is equal to how many electrons it needs to become complete. So since each atom requires one one to become complete, that means each of the other atoms will contribute one one for sharing. So we'll go to the illustration on that. You see the hydrogen atom, the first atom is given a red electron. The second atom is given a green electron. So they need to see the arrows pointing towards each other. That means they're going to contribute one more electron each for bonding or for covalency. So at the end of it all, you see the two electrons coming at, the, at their midpoint, the red and the green one coming together. At the end of the day, each hydrogen atom will have two electrons each because the electron that is shared belong to both atoms. That means their K-shell each become complete. So we we'll call that a bond pair. A bond pair of electrons. Because we we'll see that in, in a molecule, the electron used in bonding is called a bond pair. So hydrogen has a pair, a bond pair or one bond pair. Bond pair, that pair refers to two electrons. So when we say a pair, it means two. So we we'll have a bond pair of electrons in hydrogen molecule. And there's no lone pair. 
I will say that each bomb, you only have a bomb pair. So that I see the green and the red electron between the two atoms. So when you have a bomb pair, you place it to a single bond. So you can see a line drawn between hydrogen, the two other atoms. That line is called a single bond. So when a pair of electrons is shared between two, two atoms, you place it to a single bond. That is called single covalent bond. So summarizing hydrogen atom, we we'll say hydrogen atom possesses a bonding pair that two electrons are shared between the two atoms. Zero lone pair. Apart from that bond pair, that electron share, you don't see any other electron around hydrogen. That means it has no lone pair. And then a single covalent bond. Because a bond pair constitutes a single bond. And then the bond order of hydrogen molecule is one. So as we say, bond order refers to how many pairs shared. If a pair is shared between the atoms, that means the bond order is one. So how do you have the bond order of one? Because single bond is bond order of one. Double bond is bond out of two, and so on. We move to the next illustration, which is chlorine molecule. Chlorine molecule is also a homonuclear molecule. Why do we say it's a homonuclear molecule? Because it contains two similar atoms, chlorine and chlorine split, as you can see on the screen. Each chlorine atom has 17 electrons. So if you write the electronic configuration of chlorine, you're going to have 287 for each of them. 287 for each chlorine atom. And by virtue of having more than 3 in the atomic share, the M share contains 7. That makes chlorine a non metal. So we are trying to, we are trying to join two non metals together to form a molecule. And then the bond between non metals should be covalent bonding. Electron sharing will involve here. Now, you ask yourself how many electrons will each of them contribute since they are similar atoms? The number of electrons they will contribute is equal to the number each other required to become complete. So, if you look at chlorine, the M share requires extra 1 to complete it to all test states. That's 8 minus 7, 1. So, each other requires 1 more electron to become complete. That means each will contribute 1 more electron to, to each other to form chlorine molecule, being covalent, molecule, covalent bonding, none will donate electron. Rather, they will contribute for sharing equal number. We will now go to illustration. Look at the illustration there. You can see the chlorine, the first uh, chlorine by the left. You see the electrons are present using red balls. You see the seven electrons around it. And as I told you, how do we represent the electrons around the central chlorine? What represents the electron in the atom of share? That is seven by virtue of Lewis method. So what do we do? We put the electrons one by one, one on the north, one on the south, one on the west one on the east. When you are placed one, when that remains three, you now double any other any other uh, electron. So now you can put extra one as you have there on the north, and that is one on the on the west, and another one on the south, making everything seven. Certain apply to the chlorine atom by the right, the one with green electrons. You see how some electrons around it. Then you see one unpaired. That means each of them requires one electron to become contribute to become complete. So they contribute, look at the arrows, putting the electrons close to each other. They contribute one, one electron each. Then look at the middle structure, where you have the electron shared between the two, one red and one green at the middle, forming a bond pair. That is a bond per electron in chlorine. And that bond pair will play with a single bond. Then look at this chlorine molecule that is formed. You notice that there are other electrons in chlorine that are not using bonding in that molecule. Look at the in the molecule the chlorine on the right the right hand side with le red electrons has two four six electron red electron around it six electrons around their chlorine atom on the left hand side and that six electrons is three pairs divided six by two. Then the chlorine on the right hand side with green electrons also has six around it that is not used for, that are not used for bonding. That means also three pairs. So these electrodes that are not used for bonding, that are surrounding the atoms, those uh, represented by the red and the green balls, are called the lone pairs. So six on the red and six uh, on green. Six plus six gives you 12. Divide 12 by 2, you have six. So six pairs of lone, six lo uh, uh, lone pairs of electrons. 
The, the bumper is the one at the middle of the two atoms. The red and green, we call that one the bumper. The one contributed in bond formation. Either called the bumper or you call it bonding pair. Or you can say called the shared pair. And it's the one that will replace with a single bond. So let's look at the summary of chlorine bonding. So chlorine molecule possesses a bonding pair of electron, as we have described, six lone pairs of electrons, a single bond, and bond order of one. As the bond order one of one comes in when you have a pair of electrons being shared or a bond pair, that is bond order of one. Okay. We go to another molecule called oxygen. Oxygen is also another homonuclear molecule. Let's discuss the bonding in oxygen. So, oxygen molecule splits into two similar atoms, O and under O. The atomic number of oxygen is 8. Split the electrons in the shells, 2 in the K shell, 6 in the, in the L shell for both of them because they are similar atoms. Now, oxygen is a non metal having more than 3 electrons in each shell. In this L shell or atomic shell, is a non metal. How many electrons will each of them contribute for bonding? Because the bond they are going to be covalent bonded, they're going to share electrons. So the question now is how many will they contribute? Each of them will contribute two two electrons. Because each requires two electrons to make it to make the L share up to eight. So subtract six from eight. You they need two two. So they contribute two two electrons each in covalent bonding. So let's see how it goes. You can see the oxygen, uh, each of the atoms, the one on the left hand side has two, six electrons around it. The oxygen atom on the right hand side also has six electrons around it. And out of these six, you see that two are unpaired. Those unpaired ones, you see the arrows pointing, they are attracting each other, coming together. So electrons will now move together. Okay? So when we have that, we now have oxygen. Um, two electrons coming together and the other two the other two coming together. So look at the middle structure. So we will now have two pairs of four electrons at the middle. And those two pairs of electrons at the middle are called they are called the bonding electrons. So that four electrons constitute the divide four by two constitute two pairs of electrons. So oxygen has two bond pairs of electrons at the middle of the two atoms two bond pairs means four electrons we can call the bond pairs or shared or you can see called the bonding pairs then if you look around the oxygen molecule the one on the left hand side you see also four electrons that are not used for bonding that are not found at the center you can see them one by the west two electrons are by the west and two by the south so four electrons on the first oxygen in them at the center and then four electrons on the second oxygen at the center also one by the east side and one by the south so those electrons four on the first oxygen and four on the second oxygen making it eight divide eight by two that gives you four pairs those four pairs are called lone pairs of electron so now you come to oxygen what do we do now when I replace the electrons at the middle, the bond pairs are replaced by uh, bonds. So since there are two bond pairs at the middle, we replace them by two single bonds. And two single bonds is called double bond in chemistry or double covalent bond. So oxygen is characterized by having two bond pairs at the middle. Four lone pairs by the side and double covalent bond. So the summary, oxygen molecule possesses two bonding pairs of electrons, four lone pairs of electrons, a double covalent bond, and bond order of two in its structure. Now we'll go, for go to example four. As we are learning this, um, ha having this tutorial, if you are not subscribed to the channel, please go to the channel's uh, button, Best Science Brain, go to the subscription button, and tap or bell. You, said, you see, you see a tiny bell close to the channel's name, Best Science Brain, either by the left hand, right hand side of it or under it. Tap on it only once and get subscribed. 
you can subscribe to the video you don't need to subscribe again help us and share our videos to students in that need this uh, video so example four nitrogen also a homonuclear molecule nitrogen is placed into two atoms n plus n as you can see there the atom number of nitrogen is seven then we have two five for each nitrogen atom if you write the electronic configuration to in the k shell the many five in the l shell two five for the second atom now this is a non-metal how do you know the l shell contains five more than three electrons that means the non-metal and because they're similar we are combining two non-metals so and in non-metals they don't donate electrons they only share among themselves to satisfy the other state now look at nitrogen in the l shell of nitrogen we have five we need extra three so I'll try five from it extra three to complete its atom shell that means each of them contribute 30 electrons for bonding so you play the electrons around each nitrogen atom as you can see there one on each cardinal point one on the north one on the south one on the west one on the east remaining one they can double any one probably i double the one on the on the west side of the first atom and i doubled the one on the east side of the atom so you are seeing that nitrogen as we said before or as we speculated, speculated before each nitrogen atom requires three electrons that way you are seeing three uh, unpaired electrons in each atom so those unpaired electrons will now move together. You pull them together to the middle. So having the, that, we have uh, electrons at the middle, six at the middle. The red ones came from the first atom. The green ones came from the second atom coming to the middle. So we have six uh, electrons used for bonding. We divide the six by two. That six by two gives us three. That is three pairs. We call it three bond pairs or three shared or bonding pairs of electrons in nitrogen molecule then by the side of the nitrogen on the first of the first atom you see the two red balls that is, and also by the side of the second nitrogen you see by the what i say by the east side or right hand side you see the two green balls or electrons so those two electrons that are not used in that are not in at the middle in the molecule uh, they are not using bond according the lone pairs so two uh, red and two green that making it four divide four by two that gives you two pairs so we have two pairs two lone pairs of electrons in nitrogen molecule and three bond pairs divide the six by two three, three bond pairs or bonding pairs in nitrogen molecule and as you said three bond pairs when you have bond pair replace each bond pair by a single bond so we have three bond pairs, we have three single bonds there. And three single bonds in the molecule construct one place is called triple covalent bond. So nitrogen has a triple covalent bond. So you can see from the summary, nitrogen molecule possesses three bonding pairs, two lone pairs of electrons, triple covalent bond, and bond order of three. So we'll now go to illustration of covalency in in that should be heteronuclear, not is an error. No, let's correct it. National covalency in heteronuclear molecules. Heteronuclear molecules means molecules that contain different um, atoms. Example, HCO. Look at HCO. Hydrogen chlorine are different elements. So, you split them as we did in the former uh, for homonuclear molecules, hydrogen and one chlorine atom. They write the electronic configuration of hydrogen. K is one. Under one, K you have one. Because the atom number is one. Why chlorine seventeen? You split chlorine into two eight seven using the electronic configuration method two eight seven. Now, before you go ahead to bond, you recognize that the two elements are non-metals. Uh, so, and they ask yourself how many electrons would they require to come complete? Hydrogen requires one to become complete, while chlorine also requires one to make it all to eight. Hydrogen requires one to make the K shell to, be, to become two, while chlorine requires one to make the uh, M shell to become eight. Because they are non metal, they will still contribute electrons, even though they are different elements. So, how do you bring one electron, while chlorine will also bring one electron? So, you see the bonding there. The red electron is the electron in the K shell of hydrogen. 
while the green electrons rank chlorine are the same electrons, the same electrons in the M share of chlorine. So they'll contribute one. The one, one electron from hydrogen and one of from chlorine will come together. So you see the middle molecule there or bond uh, uh, structure there. You have the red electron and the green from chlorine are the middle pulled together. That means Hc has a bond pair. As I said, a bond pair means when you say a pair, it means two electrons. So two electrons are shared in the middle. That means you have a, a one bond pair or one bonding pair or in Hcl. Then if you look at hydrogen, all run hydrogen, you don't see any other electron around hydrogen. So the green atom there, there's no lone pair on it. Then look at chlorine. Run chlorine atom, you see the green electrons around it. That is two for six, six of it. And that means three pairs in chlorine. So there is three lone pairs um, of electrons in Hc. And these two lone pairs are constrained on chlorine only. They are not on hydrogen. And we know in chemistry, as I said, when you have a bond pair, we replace it with a single bond. So Hc has a single covalent bond. So going to the summary of this, we said a hydrogen chloride molecule possesses one bonding pair of electron, three lone pairs of electrons, a single covalent bond, and a bond order of one. We go to example number two, which is water, H2O. H2O is also a molecule of non-metals. But if you look at this H2O, it contains two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, but it contains three different atoms. Two of hydrogen and one of oxygen, giving you three atoms. We we'll now split the atoms into two hydrogen and one oxygen. As I said in any bonding, when a compound or a molecule contains more than two atoms, you have to position one of the atoms at the center. And the one you position at the center is the one that has only the element that has only only one atom in the molecule, and that is oxygen. That's why you have oxygen at the center or at the middle or in between two hydrogen atoms. So now I write the electronic configuration of each of them. Hydrogen K shell is taking one. Oxygen having eight electrons will now share it two cis, two in the K shell and six in the L shell. Hydrogen also having one. So in this situation, now we have different atoms and then different elements and three atoms. Then we we'll ask ourselves, since the elements are all non-metals, how many electrons does hydrogen require to come complete? Each other atom requires one to make the K-shell two. Why also requires two to make the L-shell two eight? That is six plus two is eight. So how would also, how would they share electrons? Also is going to bring out two for sharing, while each other's atom is going to bring out one. So also the central element. That two is going to bring out for sharing between the two hydrogen atoms. Divide that two by Two, because since it's sharing among two electron, two atoms, so divide the two electrons. Are going to bring up by two. You're going to have one, one. So you're going to that means you're going to give one to the hydrogen atom on the left and give one to the hydrogen atom on the right, and that will give you the covalent bond. So look at this the the illustration down there. You see the electron of hydrogen on the right hand right hand side as red electron. Electron of hydrogen on the right hand side as also green electron or pink electron then oxygen at the middle has six electrons around it so you place it the way i described by using one one on the each cardinal point for you start doubling so you now see that oxygen requi requires two to become complete that's why you have two unpaired in oxygen why hydrogen requires one one so you put the electrons together one from hydrogen and one from oxygen one from hydrogen and one from oxygen also coming together. You now look at the middle structure at the end of it all. You see two electrons share between oxygen and each of the hydrogen atoms by the left and by the right hand side. And that electron that is shared between oxygen and hydrogen, we call it the bond or bonding pair of electron. So how many bonding electrons do we have in water molecule? We have two pairs of bond electrons. One on the left hand side between oxygen and hydrogen, and one on the a pair on the right hand side between hydrogen and oxygen. You have two bond pairs of electrons in water. In water, then look at oxygen. Look at the hydrogen again on the left hand side on the right hand side. Apart from the bonding pair they use in water molecule, the bond pair they formed. There's no other electrons 
around hydrogen. So there's no lone pair on the hydrogen atoms. But look at oxygen at the middle. You can see two electrons up the plane and two under the oxygen atom. That means those electrons are called lone pairs. So oxygen atom at the in water molecule has two lone pairs. That is four electrons now. Two, one, two up, two down. Divide that four by two. You have two pairs, two lone pairs. And then look at the bond. What kind of covalent bond? I said before that when you have a bond pair, replace it with a single bond. Also, the bond pair by the right hand side is a single bond. The bond pair on the left hand side between oxygen and hydrogen is also a single bond. So water has single covalent bond, two lone pairs and also two bond pairs. So let's see the summary. Water molecule possesses two bonding pairs of electrons, two lone pairs of electrons, a single covalent bond, and bond order of one. Look at example three, hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide consists of two elements, hydrogen and sulfur, but three atoms. Why did I say three atoms? There are two of hydrogen and one of sulfur. We split, making sure that the element that has only one atom, sulfur is placed at the middle in the molecule. You can see the, the, the illustration there. We now write the electronic composition of hydrogen, one under the K-share for each hydrogen atom. Then sulfur, the number is 16. We have two H6 under K, L, and M-share respectively. They will now ask ourselves, how many electrons does each hydrogen atom require to complete? Each requires one, one to fill up the K shell. Why sulfur requires two to fill up the M shell? So sulfur is going to bring out two to be shared between two hydrogen atoms. What it means, divide out two, it, 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 sulfur is bring out by two because it's sharing among two uh, similar atoms. That'd be one, one. So sulfur contributes one, one to both hydrogen atoms. So let's look at the bonding. So in the bonding, you can see the one electron of hydrogen represented with a, a dark or black uh, dot on the left-hand side. And then the one electron of hydrogen on the right-hand side also represented by, by the black dot. Y sulfur represents the atom's electron also cis with the blue dots. You can see the way it's illustrated. And then in that sulfur, we see that two electrons of sulfur are unpaired. That means that confirms that sulfur requires two electrons to complete. And that two is going to contribute one to each hydrogen atom, as we described earlier on. Share that two divided by two. One to each this hydrogen on the left hand side, one to the other one on the right hand side. So you put the electrons together, you now have the bond formed between sulfur and hydrogen hydrogen atoms. So you have two electrons that are shared between sulfur and each of the hydrogen atoms. And then that means four electrons are being shared. And that four electrons means two pairs divided four by two. So that means hydrogen sulfide has two bonding pairs of electrons. Then on, on sulfur, you're going to see two electrons above sulfur and two electrons are below sulfur, not used for bonding. That means four electrons divided by two also. That gives you two lone pairs of electrons in hydrogen sulfide. And then we have also single bond in hydrogen sulfide because a bond pair is a bo single bond. So there are two bond pairs on different sides of sulfur. That is single covalent bond in hydrogen sulfide. Why didn't you call it double bond? Because you are having two bonds, single bonds. We can't call it double bond because the bonds are not concentrated between only two atoms that are separated. So it's single bond. So having done that, let's summarize hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide possesses two bonding pairs of electrons two lone pairs of electrons, a single covalent bond, and bond order of one. Going to example four, ammonia. Ammonia consists of, look at, uh, two elements, nitrogen and hydrogen, yes, but four atoms, one of nitrogen and three of hydrogen, making it four. As I said, the element that be at the middle will be the one that has only one atom, which is nitrogen. You can see the distribution. While the hydrogen atom, the third one will surround the ni nitrogen. The electronic configuration is shown there. Each hydrogen atom has one electron under its case shell. While nitrogen, which is has seven electrons distributed, two in the K shell and five in the L shell. So having done that, we now 
do the bonding. Nitrogen is a non-metal. You can see that by virtue of having more than three electrons in the atmosphere. And also hydrogen is a non-metal, as I described before. It's also a non-metal. So each hydrogen atom requires one and one to become complete. Why nitrogen requires three. That means nitrogen is going to bring out three electrons to share among three hydrogen atoms. So that three is going to bring out divided by three. Since it's sharing among three similar atoms, you're going to have one one. So you're going to out of the three, you're going to contribute one to each hydrogen atom. So you can see the bonding. So you see the hydrogen, one electron, the dot on each other atom, the, the black dot or on okay, the red dot on each hydrogen atom. So we we'll have that's one valence electron. Why nitrogen has five valence electrons? You can see five electrons. See five valence electrons around nitrogen. That's those pink balls. They now see hydrogen, one one electrons for the hydrogen atom. So hydro nitrogen requires uh, three extra electrons to get complete, become complete. So you're going to contribute three for sharing of a bonding. So you divide those three electrons by three. So you're going to because you're sharing it among three hydrogen atoms, that's going to give you one each. So you're going to give one to each hydrogen atom. So you see the electrons coming together. So end of bonding, you see that one electron from hydrogen pairs with one with from nitrogen on the left hand side. One electron from nitrogen pairs with one from hydrogen on the right hand side. And one from hydrogen pairs with one from hydrogen under, that is underneath nitrogen. So you have three bonding pairs of electron. In ammonia, you have three bonding pairs, a lone pair on top of nitrogen and single covalent bonds in the molecule. So summarizing ammonia, we have uh, three bonding pairs of electrons, a lone pair of electron, a single covalent bond and bond order of one. Going to the next molecule, example five, methane. So methane consists of, uh, is a heterogeneous molecule, consists of two different atoms, carbon and hydrogen, but Two different elements, carbon and hydrogen, but five atoms, one of carbon and four of hydrogen. The element that has only one atom is carbon, and that means carbon will be at the center of the four hydrogen atoms. So you can see the electronic configuration of hydrogen, one under the K-share for each of the hydrogen atoms. You can see that of carbon, the number of carbon is six. So the sharing will have two under the K-share and four under the L-share. So having done that, we now write the electronic configuration of a Okay, we have having done that to go to carbon and then place the four valence electrons around carbon. So you have the green balls around carbon and then one one red ball around hydrogen. So carbon being the central element to bring up four electrons for sharing. Since it needs four, that implies that you're going to bring up four electrons for sharing. Divide the four by four. Since you're sharing the four electrons among the four hydrogen, that means you're going to contribute one each to each hydrogen atom. So you see electron of carbon, the green and the red from hydrogen coming together at each Gardner point. At the end of the day, you now have a, a bond. There is four bonding pairs of electron around carbon. Four bonding pairs of electron around carbon, and no lone pair in methane. So and each bonding pair gives you a single bond. So you see the methane structure. So summarize methane. Methane possesses four bonding pairs of electron zero lone pair of electron, a single covalent bond, and bond order of one. Going to number six, we have CO2. CO2 consists of two different elements, carbon and oxygen, but three atoms. Because the three atoms decide on the one that be at the center, that is carbon, the one that has only one atom in the, in the molecule, that is carbon. Right electronic conversion of uh, oxygen, carbon and oxygen and the uh, oxygen again. So oxygen is two six in the K and L shell. Hide carbon two four and then oxygen again two six. You ask us uh, how many electrons do the central element require? Carbon requires four. It requires four, that means it's going to bring out four electrons for sharing among the two oxygen. Divide the four by two. That going to give, means it's going to give two two to each oxygen atom. And meanwhile you look at oxygen, oxygen atom requires two, two electrons. So carbon contributes two to each oxygen, while oxygen also contributes two to carbon. So you see the bonding, you have the four electrons around carbon, 
by presented by the pink balls. And then you have four unpaired electron carbon that shows he needs four electrons, while also it has two unpaired, so that it requires two. So two from carbon moves to the oxygen on the left hand side that also brings two. Two from carbon also moves to oxygen on the right hand side that also brings two. So we have the bonding and then we have the structure and the bonding. We have um, on the left hand side of carbon, between carbon and oxygen, you have two pairs of electron. And also on the right hand side, between carbon and oxygen, you have also two pairs. So that may give you a total of four pairs. So CO2 has four bonding pairs of electron between carbon and oxygen, both left and right hand side. Then if you look at oxygen on the left side, you see two, two pairs, one by the left, by the west, and one underneath, of, uh, underneath the oxygen atom. Two pairs not using bonding. The oxygen on the right hand side also see two pairs of electron not using bonding. That also give you a total of four pairs, four lone pairs not using bonding. They look at the structure. The bond pairs between carbon and oxygen, there are two in each case that give you a double bond in CO2. So CO2 possesses four bonding pairs of electron, four lone pairs of electron, a double covalent bond, and bond order of two. We now go to properties of covalent molecules. Covalent molecules are gases and liquids at low, with low melting and boiling points. In contrast, diamond has strong covalent bond because each carbon atom in diamond uses its four valence electrons to form covalent bonds with neighboring carbon atoms, and this accounts for its high melting point. So what we are saying that generally covalent molecules are gases and liquids and are known to have low melting point and boiling point when you compare to any compound that have high melting and boiling point due to the electrostatic attraction that exists between positive and negative ions. But covalent molecules have low melting and boiling point. But giant structure or like diamond, even though it's covalent, which consists of carbon atoms, is a contrast to the properties of covalent molecules. Diamond has high melting and boiling point, just like ionic compounds, even though it's covalent because of the strong covalent bonds formed in diamond between the carbon atoms. Okay, number two, say covalent molecules formed by atoms of equal or almost equal electronic values are non-polar and do not dissolve in water, rather dissolve in non-polar solvents such as benzene, toluene, tetrachloromethane, hexene, and so on. Covalence is associated with atoms of low electronegative difference. So as we explained before, the homonuclear covalent molecule like oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, that is covalent molecule that consists of similar atoms, are usually insoluble in water because the atoms have equal electronegativity. But covalent molecule that like HCl or ammonia that have atoms that are how wide difference in the electronegativity, electronegativity are polar. This one dissolves in water. But those that are made of similar atoms or homonuclear molecules are actually insoluble in water, dissolving non-polar solvents. Number three, solutions of covalent molecules do not conduct electricity. That is, they do not form electrolytes due to absence of ions. We'll look at this exercise that says hydrogen chloride is a covalent molecule. Briefly explain why explain why aqueous hydrochloric acid conducts electricity, but a solution of hydrogen chloride in methyl benzene, or known as toluene, con does not conduct electricity. Should not conduct does not conduct electricity. To correct the error. We'll take the question one more time. Hydrogen chloride is, is a covalent molecule. Briefly explain why aqueous hydrochloric acid conducts electricity, but a solution of hydrogen chloride in methyl benzene or toluene does not conduct electricity. 
does not conduct electricity. The error is corrected, please, in the question. So we'll now go ahead. Solution. Hydrogen chloride is a, po is a polar molecule because it consists of two atoms of large electronegative difference and dissolves as well as ionizes in water to produce more by hydrogen ions and chloride ions. This explains why aqueous HCl is an electrolyte and conducts electricity. Being covalent, HCl also dissolves in non-polar solvents such as toluene or methyl benzene, but does not con does not ionize in such a solvent and cannot conduct electricity due to absence of ions. So, in summary, what we are saying is that HCl is a covalent molecule because it consists of two non-metals. And then being covalent, we may not expect it to dissolve in water or to conduct electricity. But it does. Why? Because it is made of two elements with wide difference in their electronegativity. How is in group one, chlorine is in group seven. As I earlier said on said said in on this video, that when elements or when a molecule consists of elements that are far from each other in the periodic table. Even if it's a, a covalent substance, that molecule will be polar or will dissolve in water. So HCl conducts current because it dissolves in water and splits into ions, hydrogen ion and chloride ion. The ions are the charge carriers in solution. That why is electrolyte when it's in, a, in aqueous solution. Then also being covalent, it's supposed to also dissolve in a non-polar solvent like toluene. But when it dissolves in, in toluene, it can conduct current. E solution in toluene or methyl benzene can conduct current because in toluene it does not produce ions. We will now move to shapes of covalent molecules. Covalent molecules can have different shapes, the ranging from linear shape, angular shape, uh, tetrahedral shape, and so on. And the shape of Covalent molecules is predicted by what we call the valence shell electron repulsion theory. So this theory predicts that electrons in the outermost shell of a molecule, of a molecule, the electron clouds, tend to repel each other, making the molecule to have a distorted shape. So valence shell electron repulsion theory tells us that electrons in the outermost shell of a molecule or electrons that surround the central atom in a molecule tend to repel themselves. And that will make the molecule to have a bent or twisted shape or distorted shape that will give rise to either trigonal pyramidal shape, trigonal planar shape, tetrahedral shape, and so on. Different shapes assumed by covalent molecules. So that is this theory that explains the shape of covalent molecules. So in, in this video now, or in this section of the video, we're going to look at the shape that covalent molecules can acquire and we're going to summarize it in a table that will make it easy for us to understand so whenever i look at a covalent molecule we can able to predict the shape of we can be able to predict the shape of such covalent molecule so let's read you say the valence shell electron repulsion theory speculates that the electrons in the valence shells of a molecule repel each other this repulsive effect tends to cause a distortion in the bond lens of the molecules, giving rise to different shapes of molecules. Full stop. Higher repulsion usually occurs between lone pairs or non bonding pairs. And bonding pairs of electrons. The table below gives examples of some shapes of molecules bond angles and corresponding examples. So what we are saying is this, the electrons in a molecule repair themselves, but we experience more repulsion when there is a lone pair surrounded by bonding pairs. So lone pair repairs bond pairs more than bond pairs repair themselves. So we have a table. That table gives us shapes of some simple molecules. So number one, bonding sequence. When we have two atoms, two atoms in a molecule, each having equal number of lone pairs, 
two atoms each having equal number of lone pairs will give you a linear shape and the bond angle of linear shape is 180 degrees examples are nitrogen hydrogen chlorine oxygen and bromine you see that those molecules are made of two atoms and each of them having the same number of lone pairs number two two atoms with one of the bonded atoms having zero lone pair we have two atoms and one of them has zero lone pair while the other one have lone pairs on it we also have a linear shape 180 degree example here here in here here hydrogen has no lone pair while chlorine has three lone pairs likewise in hbr and hf number three instance is three atoms three atoms with the central at atom having zero lone pair three atoms where the central atom three atoms a molecule where the central atom has no lone pair we also give you a linear shape bond angle 180 degrees like in co2 in co2 oxygen atoms surrounding the co2 left and right have uh, have a uh, two lone pairs each while carbon at the middle has no lone pair in barium hydride barium atom at the middle has no lone has a uh, okay we'll look at the structure and then confirm that so number four four atoms with the central atom having a zero lone pair we have four atoms in a molecule the central atom has no lone pair you have a shape called trigonal planar and the bond angle of trigonal planar is 120 degree like in boron fluoride they have four atoms there are one boron and three fluorine in boron fluoride this boron has no lone pair while fluorine if fluorine atoms will have six lone pairs each likewise in boron chloride trichloride so number five three atoms with the central atom having two lone pairs and the surrounding atoms with zero lone pair will have angular or v shape and the bond angle of angular or v shape is 104.5 degrees approximately 105 degrees example in water in h2o you are having three atoms there the central atom is oxygen which has two lone pairs while the hydrogen by the side has no lone pair likewise in hydrogen sulfide so you see three atoms with the central atom having two lone pairs and the surrounding atom with zero lone pair also explained then number six four atoms with the central atom having a lone pair and the surrounding atom have zero lone pair four atoms a molecule have four atoms with the central atom having is lone pair and the surrounding atom having zero lone pair we have trigonal pyramidal shape bond angle is 107 degree example is ammonia and phosphine then the number seven shape is four atoms with all the atoms having zero lone pair when the molecule has four atoms and all the atoms have no lone pair the shape that results is a tetrahedral shape bond angle about 109.5 degrees methane is a typical example so let's look at uh, examples of linear shape molecules you can see the first example chlorine whereby you have two atoms and and the two atoms have equal lone pair so you look at chlorine molecule there each of the atoms on the left and the right hand side have three three lone pairs you give a linear shape and the example we are mentioned about linear shape is when you have two atoms in which one of the atom has no lone pair look at that test here hydrogen has no lone pair but chlorine has three lone pairs that gives you also a linear shape then the third example we saw on linear shape is when you have three atoms and then the central atom has no lone pair like in carbon four oxide you have three atoms one of carbon and two of oxygen the central atom carbon has no lone pair but the side the atom by the side oxygen have lone pairs equal lone pairs that will also give you a linear shape then when we talk about trigonal planar we say that it consists a molecule of four atoms where the central atom has no lone pair four atoms where the central atom has low, low lone pair like in boron um, trichloride or boron trifluoride you we'll look at the electronic structure of uh, fluorine two nine that is two seven for each fluorine atom why boron is five the number is five they have two three and then boron 
is going to be at the middle because the central atom, even though it's a metalloid, but is not a weak, is not a strong element. The bond there is uh, left, is covalent. So you see the bonding with between boron and fluorine. Boron bringing three electrons, and each fluorine bringing one one electron for bonding. So boron bringing three electrons, and each fluorine bringing one electron for bonding, and then at the end of the day a strong element the bond there is uh, left is covalent so you see the bonding with between boron and fluorine boron bringing three electrons and if fluorine bringing one one electron for bonding so boron bringing three electrons and if fluorine bring one electron for bonding and then at the end of the day you see so So we have the shape formed here. In that shape, boron trifluoride, boron has no electron on it. There is no lone pair. Why the three atoms, each of them has three lone pairs. So a solution of four atoms in a molecule, where the central atom has no lone pair, gives you trigonal planar shape. Trigonal planar shape, one to the degrees. Then move to another shape called trigonal pyramidal shape it's also similar to the other one we just studied now trigonal planar but there is a difference it consists of also four atoms in a molecule but the central atom will have a lone pair look at ammonia formation there between uh, nitrogen and the uh, hydrogen the central atom of a uh, nitrogen has a lone pair on it and then that gives you trigonal pyramidal the electrons on top of nitrogen will repel the bond pairs between nitrogen and hydrogen giving you a trigonal pyramidal shape of bond angle 107 degrees bond angle 107 degrees so look at the difference between trigonal pyramidal and trigonal planar let's go back to trigonal planar planar in trigonal planar the central atom boron has no lone pair on it even though it has four we have four atoms in the molecule one boron and three fluorine atoms the central atom has no lone pair and that gives us trigonal planar shape but in trigonal pyramidal shape the central atom has a lone pair look at nitrogen a lone pair even though there are also four atoms similar to trigonal planar shape angular shape and that shape or color molecule angular shape normally experience when the molecule has three atoms like in water two of hydrogen and one oxygen three atoms but the central atom has two lone pairs we have an angular or v-shape in water which is 105 degrees now we'll go over to coordinate covalence covalency or dirty bonding this type of bonding is similar to covalent bonding why is this similar because it involves sharing of an electron between two participating atoms so it's involved electron sharing but it's somehow different from covalent bonding because in covalent bonding electrons are shared equally between two atoms the two atoms two or more atoms that are coming together will bring equal number for sharing but in coordinate covalent bonding there's also sharing but the difference here is that in coordinate covalent bonding the electron shared is contributed by only one atom why the other atom will come in with an empty share contributing nothing but part we partake in the sharing to attain other state. So let's read. So similar to covalent bonding, it involves the sharing of a pair of electrons between participating atoms. However, unlike covalent bonding, the lone pair of electrons to be shared in that bonding is contributed by only one of the atoms while the other atom provides an empty shell but participate in the bond formation coordinate bonding or oh, another dirty bonding coordinate dirty bonding is observed in the formation of certain ions such as ammonium ion that's nh4 plus hydrozonium ion H3O plus metal complexes such as tetramine copper 2 complex and also in boron trifluoride and ammonia uh, bond so 
that, that is examples of coordinate covalent substances. So let's now look at the illustration of coordinate covalent substances. We're going to use ammonium ion, NH4+. First of all, we're going to separate one hydrogen from, remove one hydrogen from ammonium, and that will give us hydrogen ion plus ammonia. So ammonium ion is formed by combining hydrogen ion and ammonia. So giving you ammonium ion, so this is the component or the constituent of ammonium ion. So the bond of formation of ammonium ion is between ammonia and hydrogen ion. So we'll go down and show the bonding in ammonia, which we have studied before. Ammonia there has two lone, it's a lone pair on top of nitrogen and single bonds between nitrogen and hydrogen. Why hydrogen ion doesn't have any electron? We know that hydrogen atom has an electron, one electron in the K shell. But as an ion, it must have lost the, that one electron to form positive charge. That means hydrogen ion has an empty K shell. And for it to be concertified or to have complete two electrons, a duplex state, two electrons in the case here, you need to accept or you need to share in two electrons on nitrogen. So that hydrogen ion will just go up to the nitrogen uh, electron and attach itself there so that it becomes complete. That's what you see there. So you can see the hydrogen attaching itself to the lone pair of electron on nitrogen so that it gains two electrons. But remember that ammonia already, the Atoms in ammonia are already certified. Nitrogen already has eight electrons around it because each of the single bonds is two, two electrons, two, four, six. So the three single bonds is six electrons, plus the two on top of nitrogen, making it eight. So that is already certified. Why each hydrogen around nitrogen is having two, two certified. So there's no problem with, an, with an ammonia. But hydrogen ion is the one that is deficient that needs to, to become complete and that two electrons it finds on top of nitrogen that's why it goes to attach itself like a parasite contributing nothing and the positive charge is now on the and the hydrogen ion is then shared by the whole molecule so we now have uh, you have the coordinate covalent bond between the hydrogen on top of nitrogen and then and, and then the nitrogen atom which contributed the two electrons to the hydrogen. So that's an example of coordinate covalent valency, uh, bond. And the example of coordinate covalent bond is seen in uh, an ion called ozonium ion, H3O plus, ozonium ion, otherwise called hydrozonium ion. How is hydrozonium ion formed? It's formed between, uh, it's formed as a relation between hydrogen ion and water molecule. So hydrogen ion plus water give you hydrozonium ion. So to show the bonding in hydrozonium or ozonium ion, we have to show the bonding in water and then attach hydrogen ion to the, any of the lone pairs on oxygen in water molecule. And as we said before, hydrogen ion has no electron in it. Has no electron in it because it has lost its own one, one electron to become positive charge. In water, as we have demonstrated before, there are two lone pairs of electron on oxygen. And hydrogen ion requires two electrons to complete its k shell. That means it's going to attach itself to the electron on oxygen, either the, on, the lone pair on top of oxygen or the lone pair below oxygen. If you choose any, any one and attach it, you now have this, the hydrozonium ion. So you see where the hydrogen is, is attached under oxygen, the lone pair, partaking in the bonding without contributing anything. So at the end of the day, we now have the charge belonging to the whole ion. So, you see that another example is ammonia and BF3 uh, molecule, boron trifluoride molecule and ammonia. In ammonia, you see that nitrogen has a lone pair of electron on, in ammonia, while boron fluoride has no lone pair. Boron fluoride, boron does not certify the other state in this molecule. Why do I say so? Remember, around boron, you're going to, you're seeing three covalent bonds, bonded to fluorine. There are three single bonds uh, to each fluorine, one bond to each fluorine atom. And each of the single bond is two electrons. That means around boron, there are six electrons around boron. That means boron does not satisfy the other state in this molecule. So for boron to satisfy the other state, it will attach itself to ammonia, which provides a lone pair of electrons. So, so that the boron comes in without contributing anything to attach itself to ammonia. So it will now have eight electrons around it, as you can see there. So lone pair 
provided by ammonia and boron came with nothing to attach itself. Now, if you count electrons around nitrogen, really complete because in, in ammonia, uh, electron around nitrogen is complete. Each of the bonds is uh, is two electrons, so you have three single bond. That is six electrons plus that lone pair two, giving you eight. So nitrogen in ammonia has certified the altered state, but uh, in uh, after the bonding, the nitrogen still maintains its altered state. While boron is also in altered state. Around boron, you have two electrons. I mean, three single bonds uh, attached to fluorine, and that gives you six electrons. Plus the two at the middle share between it between boron and nitrogen. That gives you eight electrons for boron. Because electron that is being shared in covalent covalency or even covalent bond will belong to the atom that are participating. That the bond pair belong to both atoms that are participating in the bonding. So, we have come to the end of this lecture. So, in our next video, we're going to be look, looking at bond properties, bond order, bond length, and bond dissociation energy. So, we are trying to explain that chemical bonding is a unique part of chemistry, necessary for chemistry students and necessary for people who are doing chemical engineering um, or chemistry related courses, biochemistry. Uh, yeah, biochemistry needs it. To a large extent in studying the organic structures and bonds in organic compounds also is a good aspect because without chemical bonding you not understand chem you not understand chemistry in that way you will be lost in organic chemistry we are bond or bonding matters a lot so there is a good aspect or a good video we are presented here if you are not subscribed to the channel please move up to the channel's name as it's going or close the channel's name you see the subscription icon or bell Tap on it only once and get subscribed. Share our videos and remain connected to this to this video to this channel. Thank you very much.